So uh, I did not write new intros last night because at, as of last night, I still couldn't complete a sentence without coughing. So I thought, why waste a bunch of intros that I probably can't read? Uh, but today, uh, I woke up a little bit better. So I'm going to do some best ofs. I'm going to so, bring back some intros from the uh, 18 months that we've been doing intros on this program. And it'll be interesting to see if you can recall the punchline. You can play along at home here, too. You can see if you can recall the punchline if you've been around long enough for some of these intros. So I'll, I'll harken back that if, I, if I need to form a time reference. I'll harken back to that, too, just to kind of set it up. And well. we go a little something like this. Hit it. All right, so Mike Carl, you're up first, and this one is from our uh, our kings and rulers uh, theme that we did the one day, uh, and uh, this is how we did Mike's. Come on. I looked up King Michael and only found one in Romania, but in Sweden there's been 16 King Carls to contribute to that insania. So forget the kings and leaders who a similar name they once took, and instead let's find a president who once said, I am not a crook. This guy once served in the Nixon White House some 50 years ago. So in honor of Mike Carl, I will erase 18 and a half minutes from today's show. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, now, uh, this one uh, was for Mike Kite. I, I wrote this one after a show in which uh, Larry said something that was quite provocative, provocative enough to spring Michael Hyde from his seat, <laughs> and we nearly had to call on the popo that day. <laughs> this guy's not that old, but he's got a few years on him, and yeah, he's lived longer than that Led Zeppelin drum on John Bonham. He moves at his own pace now, and that's just the facts, and he's never been one to jump for political party hacks. But I've never seen this guy move like I saw two weeks ago when Larry Schultz called out Ronald Reagan right here on the radio. <laughs> the Badger leapt with a ferocity and quickness I didn't think he was able, now known as the day Mike Height went all cheetah and jumped across the table. Uh, very sorry. <laughs> See, Larry, that was the reason why I couldn't do intros the last two weeks. I, what you have right now, I was still betting. I may yeah. still have to yak it up before it's over. And that's the first time I've coughed today. That's the strangest thing about it. Oh, I'm, helping, I'm happy yeah. I can inspire that. Yeah, nice. In fact, you've made it a little contagious here. Uh, this is from our uh, uh, May the 4th uh, Be With You uh, edition of the Star Wars edition of the program. Uh, he's one of the fellows who I regard as a guy in the know. This is for Larry. He's loyal to his pals just like that C-3PO. He's got a law degree, but he's still just a regular West Virginian. Though I think it's fair to say without that conservative opinion. Our audience knows him best as our resident liberal talker. Let's welcome in our hairiest panelist, Larry Schultz, our vision of Chewbacca. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Joe, you're up next. Uh, this is when we... No, I'm not bringing back the Hoff. You're all right on that one. We, we beat that into the ground for a while. And it was worth it. Yeah. Uh, this is the tale of a young Joey Torts who grew up with dreams of working in courts. So he followed his dream, a young boy so skinny, with the goal of one day being like my cousin Vinny. He graduated from law school and bought some new suits, excited to go forth and clear the two utes. But defense work didn't cut it. That's not how it went. Once Joe found out that in a civil case, your take is at least 30%. <laughs> and I remember... Good, Joe. Very good, bro. I, I was going to say, I remember the punchline was then uh, topped by Larry saying, at least 30%, Joe. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, uh, Bill, you're up next. Uh, this was from our Yogi Berra day. <laughs> there could be a lot of those. This was the anniversary of Yogi Berra's death, and uh, as a result, we did some Yogi Berra-isms. So for Bill, most recently Bill was asked to tell some famous stories about his former admiral life and his former Stubblefieldian glories. He dazzled the crowd and made them laugh and made them smile, and closed with a gem he said they should remember all the while. Wisdom can be found by walking through open doors... And always go to other people's funerals, or they won't come to yours. <laughs> <laughs> One of the better yogis in the body. Always go to other people's funerals, or else they won't come to yours. All right, our leadoff hitter traditionally over the years has been Mr. Joey Joy Twitz Ferretti, and once again, he's batting leadoff. Joseph. Well, thank you, Rob. Uh, 
an issue that, that uh, has caught my attention here the last couple of weeks, and I haven't been able to talk about it on the show, but I think it warrants uh, discussion this morning, is the housing shortage. Joe, we're, we're, we're starting to lose your phone a little bit here. I'm not sure if you just went into a difficult area of the house or your cell just kind of zapped on us. You still there? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, uh, you're good. Uh, okay. So the issue I wanted to talk about, Rob, was the uh, housing shortage in Berkeley County. And my focus here is on we doing a lot. Uh, if you some of the data and the city of Martinsburg is good about compiling some data. They do it what's called an a uh, annual action plan and they submit this information to the housing and urban development folks in DC. We can see that uh, we have a population growth here in Berkeley County of almost 20% in the last 10 years. The median income in Berkeley County has gone up 26% in the last 10 years. And yet we have a housing shortage to the point where the city of Martinsburg is reporting that we need about 1,300 residential units to house folks. Where are these people living now that don't have housing? They're living in motels. They're living in tent cities. They're living with family or friends. Uh, in Berkeley County, we have buses pulling up to motels to pick up kids now because that's where they're living. It's not conducive to learning. That's not conducive to good family life. Hey, Joe. That's not conducive to stability. A, hey, call us back, we okay? We really need to look at this issue. Joe? And determine how best to address the problem <laughs> that exists. If we're going to attract business and we're going to have more people moving into this area, we've got to be able to house them. So what is the answer? Uh, there are some solutions out there in terms of dealing with housing shortages. Local governments have, that own public land can try to repurpose that land. They can, local government leaders can get out to businesses like Procter & Gamble and try to partner with them so that uh, employees at Procter & Gamble could be placed into housing and uh, Procter & Gamble can have a bonus system or something for those employees to, to be able to afford the housing. Uh, we have a state surplus that we talk about daily on this show, it seems like. What are we doing with that money? Uh, and are, should we be looking at more tax cuts or should we be looking at a means for the state government to perhaps use some of these public funds to solve our housing crisis, which exists not only in the eastern panhandle, but also statewide? Statewide, the National uh, Income Housing Coalition, yes, so every five families looking for homes at or near the poverty level, there's only 50 units available. So, in West Virginia and locally, I think we've got a problem that needs solving. And the question I have for the group, what candidates do you hear talking about this issue? Should they be talking about it? And should we be looking at some of the availability of public funds to help solve this problem? All right, so Joe, I, I need you to call us back because your line is deteriorating rapidly. But your question was, what candidates are talking about the the housing issues, especially here in the Eastern Panhandle, and what can be done about it? Let's start first with Delegate Michael Height. Michael, well, I don't know that anybody's really talking about it, but uh, we obviously should be. Uh, you know, the I don't know that the city has has uh, of Martinsburg has built any low income housing or affordable housing in in quite some time. Um, so you know maybe uh, the city and the county need to identify some some areas and and look to do that. I do know that you know you if you if you own a house you can go to um, the housing authority and get on your, your your home can get on to the Section 8 housing uh, program. Um, and, you know, you could rent out your house through Section 8. So there is always that possibility that it doesn't have to be owned by the city of Martinsburg or Berkeley County or even the state. Um, there is that possibility there. If you own a home, you can get into that program. Um, but I, it's not just a low-income housing problem. We just don't have the housing period. That's why you see the massive building um, around Berkeley County all the time. We're just growing and growing and growing, and it's hard to keep up with the influx of people. And when the medium home or median income rises and the medium home prices rise, it, it absolutely does affect the the lifelong residents who've lived here the, their entire lives and and have 
have been able to afford homes and rent homes um you know in the six seven eight hundred dollar a month range and you just can't find those those prices anymore so it has really affected them when they haven't seen the wage increases um that that a lot of other people have so uh, i'm not sure what the answer is uh, in the short term but the in the long term we do need to look at um, getting more affordable housing uh, low-income housing built in, in berkeley county mike carl well i i agree with the, everything mike just said but uh it's a it's a good problem to have i do not believe that it's uh you know applies or is a serious problem in the, uh, the rest of the state and it's particularly in berkeley county but but it, to me and and the idea you know is there some state uh, remedy or help you know that that would be fine and i don't know that anybody's campaigning about it at this time uh, uh but but the one thing that that it does you know, to, to me it un, underwrites the argument of the need for local control and more flexibility at at the county and city level to uh you know in terms of of uh incentives and you know tax rules and so forth to uh, uh respond to this i think welcome <laughs> issue of, of growth and and both in people and 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 in uh incomes billy yeah uh <clears throat> joe raised a question that I, I have not thought very much about. In fact, I've thought very, very, very little about it. And I suspect I'm not alone in this. Uh, we have not heard anyone talking about it. We have not heard the legislators talk about it. I'm not sure it would be a compelling platform for someone to go out and solicit votes uh, because it's uh, uh, if the state gets involved, it's going to come with a substantial price tag. Uh, there are federal grants involved uh, are available. I don't don't know how aggressive the state or the county or the city has been in pursuing these federal grants. Uh, it's a and the the other question that comes in my mind is it humanitarian issue or is it an economic issue? Uh, either way you describe that would dictate of how aggressive you would be in solving the problem and who would solve the problem. Uh, if it's a, a, a economic issue i think it's probably easier to solve in some terms but again we're all uh, during this season we're very acutely conscious of humanitarian considerations so joe that was a long-winded answer i don't know uh to your question larry schultz yes this is a um a problem especially in a growth area that I don't doubt there are pockets around the state that's having that are having a similar problem, maybe not to our extent, but it, to my point of uh, view, at least, it, the question as posed by Bill, I believe this is a humanitarian issue first and and foremost. The quality of the sleep and the quality of the room in which a child sleeps before going into third grade to pick up where he left off on learning how to read is crucial. And if that is a terrible place or a motel or some other thing where there's no privacy, there's no room, there's no anything but a feeling of impending emergency, that will show up in that child's grades. If he's a B student under those conditions, he could be an A student uh, if he had a calmer home life and we've known this forever um now are there are there people who grow up in absolutely horrible situations who turn into wonderful students and and you know achieve a lot sure but the percentage is pretty low and there's a reason for that it's not easy to deal with the stresses of learning and school and the social stresses that go with school when you're living in a motel with your family <laughs> Let me say this. I don't think this is a campaign issue because I don't think it's a statewide issue. This, I think this is inherently uh, a, a problem to growth counties, and there's only a few of them in West Virginia. So if you're not a growth county, you, you know, you don't have a housing problem. However, 
when you see, uh, you know, Craig Blair has done a great job and the legislature has done a great job in luring business to he, to the, the state of West Virginia. So as you see big business come to, to West Virginia and you see those communities lifted up and people moving in and working, that could be a big problem in those communities where, where business is coming in, where it wasn't a problem before. And they will start seeing the same problems that, that Berkeley County and the Eastern Panhandle has, and it will become a statewide problem. And it's one of those things you would hope that, you know, they would look to the Panhandle and see the problems we're having now and, and try to be proactive and, and take care of those issues before they have or before they happen, because we haven't here. It's one of those things, we didn't see it coming, and now that it's here, we're trying to be reactive instead of proactive. So um, I, I think that's why you're not hearing it as a campaign issue right now. But, Mike, who has the responsibility for addressing the inadequate number of homes? Is that at the state level? Is the local level? County level? Who can you point to who has responsibility well yeah i I don't i'm not sure i know the answer to that bill because you know mike brings up a good question too and it's about you know local control you know it's it's right there in the republican platform is we're trying you know we should be trying to to institute local control local control but i can tell you there's a pushback in the, the state um the legislature um they're they're sort of resistant giving up control so i'm not sure why um but it's there so i don't see how it can't be a state problem if you're not going to give the control back to the local how how are they going to handle it if you're not going to give them the control to do it so you know you sort of have to take it on as a state issue the problem is they don't see it as a state issue because it's just happening in the panhandle yeah yeah uh you've raised a good point somewhere we don't have time to do it now, sure. uh, but the discussion of local control, you're exactly right. There's, uh, uh, I hear a lot of the legislators that I would have thought been supportive of local control. Once they get in office, they are not supportive of local control. I, this is something that should have been addressed years ago. I don't see a lot of progress in get in the county's local control well this is a little off topic and it, it is but, off but topic. i'll, yeah. I'll, I'll yeah. tell you some of the reason for that is is when they gave home rule to the cities they feel like they entrusted the cities to do a certain thing and then the cities didn't do what what they thought they were going to do so there's Repeal a the mis- BNO tax you can right see it. exactly there's a miss a little bit of mistrust yeah. there and they don't want to do the same thing again i keep telling them you know it's not the municipality's fault yeah. you all wrote a bad law yeah. but they don't like yeah. hearing that either yeah. <laughs> uh uh, Joe, it comes back to you. Yeah, well, I, <clears throat> excuse me, Rob. I think the, the uh, Larry touched on the importance of this issue. Uh, if you look at statistics, incidents involving domestic abuse, child abuse, child neglect, uh, you can even go into areas of school performance and all, you, you can trace a lot of the problems back to the housing situation. Is there a single-family home for some of these folks who, who uh, whose situations are, uh, prop up in these statistics. Uh, and, and what kind of home is it? And what kind of housing do they have? And how stable is that housing arrangement? Are they paying rent? Can they afford the rent? Are they being put out by the landlord? All this is important. If we're going to solve some of these problems and we're worried about incarceration, we're worried about rehab centers and all the money we pour into those options, that's reactive. We have to be proactive and understand that a lot of people fall prey to having problems in their personal lives because of the inability to have a single family home and to live in such an environment. So I think it's an important issue. I, I applaud the city and, and the development of the interwoven mills, uh, 387 apartments going in, but those are going to be 1400 to 1600 a month in rent. A lot of folks in our area can't afford that. Uh, it's not for them. Uh, and I don't see the kind of developments going up to house people with lower incomes. So I'm hopeful that city leaders and county leaders, uh, those running for office and those who are, uh, are in office now, will look at this issue and say, we have to put a concerted effort forward to ensure that we have housing options for other folks too not just what's being developed up there on King Street. And I I think the city owns properties that could be earmarked for future development where perhaps developers could be incentivized to build 
uh, lower income housing. And I think some of the local businesses, uh, there's comments in our Facebook page about uh, how Procter & Gamble uh, helps folks uh, obtain leases so that they have a place to live when they're going to work. Uh, I, I think it's a big issue. I hope that uh, we start paying more attention to it. And I'm going to be you know, hopefully calling on some of our uh, candidates who run for office to, to understand that uh, there's more to uh, uh, the issues of the day here in the Eastern Panhandle than what they're talking about presently. I remember many years ago watching uh, Meet the Press or something to that effect, and I think it was George Will who restated something somebody had stated years before him, which was the problem with poor people is they don't have any money, right? <laughs> That's which, kind of, which kind of gets to the root of it. Uh, and you, you talk about the new development in Martinsburg, uh, Joe, and if you build housing that costs a lot of money, it attracts people who have a lot of money. And when you have a lot of people who have a lot of money, you start to get businesses moving to your community that come to communities that have a lot of money. So you get your, your Starbucks and your Wegmans and, and your whatever that comes with that. And, and that attracts even more people to those communities who, who have a lot of money. There's, just, there's no incentive to build affordable housing for people because they don't have a lot of money. A, a, affordable housing uh, blocks don't attract businesses because those people don't have a lot of money. So it's, it's an inherent problem and who's incentivized to build affordable housing? Is a developer incentivized to build affordable housing? Well, no, because you can't make a lot of money building buildings that cost very little money. So how do you overcome that problem? Well, that's when you start to get government intervention, where you, be have, you have government incentives to build affordable housing. But not too many developers even want to take on that, especially in a time when supply lines have been difficult. Even today, it's still difficult to get something built in a timely fashion if you're trying to remodel your home or what have you. So when you get a situation like that, where is the incentive and for whom is the incentive to build affordable housing? And where are the resources as well? Joe, do you have any idea the trend line, the funding trend line of HUD? Are they Have their budget been going up or down and static? Do you know? Well, I, I, I would imagine uh, in this day and age, they're probably on the cutting block uh, in terms of their funding going forward. But I, I to answer your question, uh, Bill, no, I don't know specifically what uh, the current status is with HUD funding. Because outside of HUD, what resources do you have? Mm -hmm. uh -oh. There's nothing on the state level, nothing on the local level. Uh, so it's basically come federal funding. To answer Rob's question, I think the, the easiest way to answer it is to remember that if you live here on the day when you have a medical emergency, the guy doing those chest pumps on your chest in the ambulance on the way to the hospital is going to be a graduate of our schools. They're not going to be, our ambulances don't pay so much money that people are going to fly in from New York to work the shift, right? So they're going to be the local folks. If they grew up in the Knights Inn, they're not going to have the same quality of education that they would have if they grew up in one of the luxury townhomes that the city's getting ready to build. This is the core of our community, the working people. They will do the actual work. They'll fix your potholes. They'll fix your plumbing. They'll save your life if they can. And the question is, not so much where's the money going to come from, but how are we going to cope with the destruction of our assumed way of life as the quality of the schools deteriorates because the kids don't have a nice place to stay? Uh, you know, that it's not a direct thing mm -hmm. like Rob was talking about. It's indirect, but we're all one community. The person who serves your tea at the restaurant, they're probably a local person who probably went to school here. And so if we let that slide and say, well, there's no economic incentive to build these homes, we'll, we may find out that there's another kind of incentive uh, um, in my example, a life or death incentive to have competent people in all these local jobs that, after all, don't pay a tremendous amount of money. You're not going to retire at 40 as, a, as an EMT, but you can have a nice life, maybe better than your parents had, if you get the education that we're paying to provide. So. What's, typically what's happened in growth areas like this is working class people have to move further out. 
as the cost of yeah. living increases. Yep. You have moved further yeah. away, right? Hey, this segment of our program, as we wrap up issue number one, brought to you in part by the Berkeley County Health Department, Prevent, Promote, Protect with the Berkeley County Health Department, and by Elder Care Attorney Danny Staggers. If you or a loved one are concerned about going into a nursing home and losing assets, contact Elder Care Attorney Danny Staggers today in Martinsburg at 304-267-3915. Bill, you're on the clock. This is Talk Radio, WNR Martinsburg, and TV 10 back with Bill next. A wonderful Christmas time. And the Admiral Bill Stubblefield, who leads off with issue number two. Rob, I'm going to follow up on your lead. Uh, Mac Warner was on the show this past week. He's been on statewide talk radio. Uh, he's really doubling down on his contention that the 2020 election was stolen. Uh, what's more, he's uh, he's incorporated the influence as well as the stolen. So he's saying that the CIA was involved with the uh, uh, with the influence of the election. He uh, answered my question the other day. He considers being influenced the same thing as stealing. Uh, my question to the illustrious panel members, uh, is this good politics? Because Mac is, is running for the, for the governor's position. Is this good politics? Larry, Larry had the loudest sigh in the room, so I'm going to start. Larry has let some steam out, so this might not be as hell-bent as it would have been before the sigh. But, Larry, go ahead. In a word, no. It's terrible <laughs> politics. Um I remember this same person, if I'm not mistaken, who was our sitting Secretary of State, going on quite a bit at the time that these complaints were being made about what a safe and secure and honest and fair election West Virginia had enjoyed. Well, is it that people in West Virginia are so smart that they weren't fooled by Tony Blinken? Or is it that people in West Virginia, I mean... This is QAnon conspiracy theory garbage. There's no proof of it. You had 63 cases to prove something. And now you're talking to me about, well, this was uh, not Russian interference. It was this, that, the other. It's way remote. And if there's a problem with U.S. elections, then if you're the Secretary of State, that's your job to make sure that West Virginia's elections are first rate. Apparently, only 49 elections were stolen, not ours. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't buy it. It's just politics. Just a... But the word was good politics. No, it's terrible politics. It's like the sheriff using the word weaponization. The same thing. We know what the source of that stuff is. And they're thinking, well, I can jump on this little little uh, box car at the end of the Trump train uh, by using the same words that he does to describe um, ordinary events in American history. Um, it's too bad. It was actually a little calmer than I thought it might be. <laughs> I, well, he was building. You give, was him another, building. give him another couple of minutes and he would have <laughs> I think, I think it's the high seat. The, yeah. I think it's that lofty perch on the seat. Yeah, it is. All yeah. right. Uh, Mr. Bunny Rabbit? <laughs> well, I, I'm going to agree with Larry that a lot of this is just politics. And, and the reason you don't see these cases um, tried the way they should be or investigated the way they should be is because of politics. If it's if it's your guy that's making, you know, the the questionable acts, um, you know, you sort of say, do I, you know, you look at right now the Justice Department. The Justice Department's not going to bring any of these cases, whether there's evidence or not. You have individuals who, according to Mac Warner, have come and testified that that there were issues, um, and you know these are credible witnesses. So why aren't these things being investigated? If the issues happened in Pennsylvania, and the Secretary of State of Pennsylvania is a Democrat, he may overlook him. So no, nope, everything's good here. You know, you, you have that because it is politics. So the problem is we don't we don't have the integrity of our elections that, you know, I say we used to, but hell, we didn't have very good integrity of our elections before. You would certainly hope that as technology advances, um, that there is better and better 
uh, integrity for elections. But then when you hear things that are happening in other areas where, you know, people are stuffing ballot boxes and, and do a ballot harvesting and things like that, it makes you question the integrity of our elections. So I can see where these you call them conspiracy theories come along. I see where they come along. When you can actually see evidence of this type of thing happening, people start saying, well, maybe our elections aren't as as fair as we thought they were and, and that there isn't the integrity that we thought we had. So it lends credence to these types of, of accusations. The problem is, should I then reject Mac Warner's statement that our election was fair? I didn't reject it. Well, he part- said our election was fair. I took his word for it. Now he's suddenly out there in a different place saying, uh, well, we can't can't trust these elections. Well, no, what Mac is saying is West Virginia doesn't have ballot harvesting. West Virginia, in the way that they do their, their elections, um, their digital elections, aren't the same as all the other states. But you can go state by state has the option of, of having their elections the way they want. We don't have ballot boxes. We don't have ballot harvesting. So it keeps it a whole lot safer and more integrity into how we're doing the elections here in West Virginia. And I think that's what he's saying is that these other states are allowing these these types of voting that are ripe with fraud. And it's the same problem that we've had since the beginning of these claims. A lot of talk, no proof. But there has Give been the proof. proof. You can see, there's. I, I, I saw on tape a woman in, in, I forget which county it was, but physically in the morning, like 6 o'clock in the morning, stuffing ballot boxes full of, of, of ballots so that her mayor that she worked for could get elected. And she's been prosecuted for it. Those types of things are happening all over the place. You, you may only see it in one or two, but if it's happening in one or two, trust me, it's happening a whole lot more. Let's go to okay. Joe Ferretti via telephone. Joe? Well... Uh, Mac Warner conveniently forgets that West Virginia liberalized voting methods during the era of COVID in 2020. We we en- enlarged and enhanced our mail-in voting options, and and he, he forgets that. Uh, well, other states did it too, but he, he wants to denigrate those states, but uphold uh, West Virginia as being uh, the, the uh, paragon of virtue when it comes to voting. The the bottom line here is. Uh, for the chief election official in this state to be going on and on about these conspiracy theories is reckless. It is extremely reckless. And and he feeds into the narrative that is developing and, and has developed that you can't trust elections in this country. And, and I think that is a great disservice to the public. Uh, and and I, it's, it's really a derogation of, of, of the duty he has to – to, when he runs for office, to run on an evidence-based campaign, not one that's built on conspiracy theories. It, it, there's two ways to look at these elections. You can look at it mechanically, okay, how we vote, how we collect the votes, how we uh, vet and, and, and authenticate those votes, and then how we ultimately tabulate them for final results. And then you can look at the way he's looking at it, which is, excoriating people like Mark Zuckerberg, who, who uh, sat on stories and didn't publish them in Facebook, and the CIA who, that sat on the story of Biden's laptop, and that, that didn't make it to the media. So, you know, by trickery, this, this vote in 2020 was invalid. By that measure, the, the election in 2016 was stolen when FBI's Comey came out a couple weeks before the election and announced he was investigating Hillary Clinton's use of a private email server. And you can argue that it was stolen from John Kerry when he was swift voted by the, uh, the Bush campaign uh, in, in what was a dishonest approach. So, you know, that standard is ridiculous to say it was stolen. Uh, it mechanically, as over 60 courts have proven and have re- uh, concluded, the, the election was valid. End of story. Joe, I go back to Dukakis and whoever convinced him to get in that tank with that helmet on and ride around. That stole the election, too. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the standard <laughs> that, that uh, apparently we have to abide by now. That is an everlasting stealing image. it. That was throwing it away. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Carl. Well, I, I agree with much of what 
just already been said about this, but that and that the mechanics of the you know ballot counting and taking is is you know and just sort of publicity you know and what you hiding news is not stealing a, an election, but, but clear clearly Warner is just using this theme to appeal to the Trump voters <laughs> in West Virginia. And, and, and we, we need to stop it. I mean, I, uh, West Virginia, th- there was corrupt elections in West Virginia when I was younger, you know, and that's why I'm a Republican. <laughs> and, but but I, think, I think that's definitely behind us in many ways. But, but I'm, I'm comfortable that these other states – uh, you know, to the ex- to extent there are allegations, and, and, and there's been no more pressure on looking at at uh, you know the uh, presidential voting throughout the country than there was you know in this past election, and and and, and it is just all to trying to you know claim the the Trump theme, which is undermining uh, the. Uh, all the substantive progress that was made with Trump, and 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 distracting from it, and and I, I think uh, we we need to move on from that. Ken Matson said, "You're now a rhino, Mike." <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm a Republican, and I've been before it longer than Ken Matson. Yeah. All right, final thought comes back to you, Billy. Yeah, I want to thank Mike Carl for bailing my question out. <laughs> Because my question was not the legitimacy of the last election. My question was, was this good politics? Uh, obviously, uh, uh, Mac Warner is in a very tight race with uh, with uh, Marcy. Uh, he has to find some niche that will work for him. I think he's identified the Trump base as that niche. He's playing to the Trump base. I think he's already got Mike Flynn as a uh, uh has endorsed him he's hoping to get donald trump to endorse him uh and i think this is all in my view smart politics on mac warner's play uh uh, part trying to get to build up the support of the trump base for his vote. So I, smart I, politics, but is it good politics, Bill? I did not. Uh, that was your question. Is it good politics? Said good politics. I, in this case, I, I view smart and good in the same way. Very yeah. good. If you win, it's good politics. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. On, but, but I think he's put all of his horses, all of his eggs in the yeah, single basket. So. I agree. Yeah. I thought you were going to mix metaphors and I say. I did. I did. And I, got, <laughs> and I was afraid that, oh, I'd be licking the mule's face when I backed off. <laughs> but all of, his, all of his eggs in one horse. <laughs> <laughs> all the horse eggs in one basket. <laughs> we can, we can, we can put, that, put that metaphor in a blender and mix it up real good, can't we? We had a different name for horse eggs where I came from. You, 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 you keep pushing me, Mike. I, I'm going to be forced to talk about the bunny rabbit. Speaking of Mike, Hyde, you are up with issue number three. All right. Um, I have often said that a third party can't win the presidency. I know there's some argument there, but what I really want to know is, can there be a viable option in West Virginia where the Democratic Party has declined to a degree that they're not really uh, viable in a lot of these elections because they've become so red in a lot of ways? Could a third party rise up and, and make a difference in West Virginia politics? And and I'll preface it with that because we have somebody who ran as a third party candidate here in West Virginia, um, and not and, successfully, and not, not successfully. <laughs> but I would I would counter with I think politics has changed somewhat yeah. since you ran um, your race. Yeah. And, and, and Bill, I'll start with you. You've seen some third party races that have picked up some attention. George Wallace got electoral votes in the South. Uh, John Anderson was a big third-party name. Ross Perot, obviously the most successful of the third-party candidates. Teddy Roosevelt before then, that was the one that people, that was the group that people identify with. Mike, I disagree with you on both counts, uh, which is not unusual. Uh, we, we tend to disagree on a lot of things. One, I do not think in ruby red west virginia you'll find a third party regardless of how decimated the democratic party is i just think that west virginia shifted way too far to the right uh for a third party to be viable 
even though I'd like to see one, I don't think it will happen. However, on the national level, and this is the second area we disagree, I know there's never the most a third party has ever gotten was, I think, 17% with Ross Perot. I see it's a different world today than we've had in years past. We have two potential leaders of each party, vastly unpopular with the masses. If we've ever been set up to have a viable third party, which we yield we have not had in the past, if we've ever had a chance to set up a viable third party, I think this situation lends itself. Yeah, Ross got 19%. 19%, uh, okay. Ticky-tacky, but to be accurate, he did get 19%. Larry? Um, yeah, the, I don't see West Virginia as being particularly susceptible to this because the amount of what I will call Republican-on-Republican Republican political violence has not grown enough yet. <laughs> As the Republican you need, Party, you need to come to Charleston. <laughs> well, I read the paper about <laughs> I read the paper about Jefferson County, and that's the model that a lot of Democrats are looking to, uh, where all day long there's lawsuits being filed and people arguing with each other, and when you dig into it, every single one of them is a Republican, and they're all fighting with each other <laughs> until that gets to a crescendo and really breaks the party into two chunks. Then you may have an opportunity for a, uh, you know, for an offshoot of the main Republican Party uh, to be the Trumper Party, or uh, going the other way uh, for the majority of Republicans to remain with Donald Trump and the rest to move to a more typical uh, Archmore kind of Republican. Um, so. That could be in the future, but I think it's still quite a ways off. Joe? Uh, yeah, Larry, I'm going to pick up on that point because I think you struck uh, something there that, that has kind of resonates with me, which is if we look at the data in the last 10 years regarding party registration in West Virginia, of course we know the Republicans have built up a little bit. The Democrats have had a lot of defections. But those folks didn't go register Republican. A majority of them have registered independent. And if we see this, uh, this division on the Republican side, which I think, as you indicate, is brewing and now becoming more and more prevalent, not only in the legislature, but even, even back home in, in places like Jefferson County, uh, I think you're going to see a lot of disaffected Republicans saying, boy, this this is not my party anymore. And they may defect. And I don't think because of tribalism they're going to suddenly register as Democrats. I think they're going to go independent, too. So I, I agree. I think we're years off. But what could develop in West Virginia is a potentially viable independent party. Michael. Well, I I agree uh, that that it's not the you know the prospects of the third party winning the election. It's what the effect it has on the election, and and as 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 both of you just said, and and that as the you know the Republican you know side has grown, you know the divisions have emerged in West Virginia, and and I don't you know I th I don't think we're near the crisis. That that could lead to, but but it it certainly I think is a legitimate issue on the national level that not you know and then you got the the electoral college issues and all that but but it 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 it's it's not about the third party winning it's about the effect of the third party on one or the other uh, major parties. Good point, Badger. Well, I I think I think. It is ripe for a third party, and I'll, I'll tell you why. I, I see that the Democratic Party from West Virginia, way back when we were blue, was was 
working class blue. They weren't progressive blue. So when you when you see the progressive blue make strides on the left, I think a lot of what you've seen is the defection of those working class blue in West Virginia. And, and you're right, they didn't defect all to Republican. They, they went to the middle. And I think they were all, always in the middle. They were just discouraged by their own party. And I can see that happening on the Republican side as well. When you have people like Mike Carr, and myself, who have been conservative all our lives, referred to as rhinos on a regular basis, um, even though we, we ascribe to the, the Republican um, platform, we're still called rhinos, that you're going to see more and more of those move to the, well, not move to the middle, just stay where we were. But it lends itself to an independent rising, a third party rising up that's, that's that centrist party. And I can see it happening here in West Virginia more so than other areas. Mike, I, my question not mean to belittle your point. I think you're making a very good point. What would you call this third party? Labeling is so important in something like this. You're absolutely right. I mean, it it could be the no labels or something like that. (laughs) Joe said rational. Is that what you said, Joe? Rational? Rational. But (laughs) but anything other than Republican is is suspicion. (laughs) Anything other than Republican, there's suspicion. Well, with any any third party, naming it is key, number one. But having the right individuals lead it is also key. And you would have to have well-known, established uh, politicians that are respected they would have to move and try to rise that party up. Yeah, the reason I'm making that point, and I agree in both cases, that you have to have the right people on the national level. Uh, they, I think they're going to be able to find leaders to run easier than they can find a name that will attract I would agree with that. You know, the, the rhino part is kind of, again, Ken Matson said that in jest, by the way. <laughs> Mike, he wasn't trying to poke the bear. Just, uh, I was. Uh, not Ken. Um, but we had uh, Senator Robert Carnes on earlier this week. And uh, it, one of the points he was making was that Craig Blair, who I think up until about a month ago, just about everybody in the Eastern Panhandle thought was pretty far conservative. Yeah. Uh, pretty well-established conservative, fairly far right uh, was describing Craig as a liberal who was surrounding himself with liberals in the Senate to push his liberal agenda through. And when you hear those words, you think to yourself, well, if Craig's liberal now, just how far right is the far right of the Republican Party? If Craig is now considered a liberal. Yeah. And going back to the discussion a second ago, the name and the um, uh, the leadership, I can see a new party emerging with Mike Height as the head and they name the Bunny Rabbit Party. You know, that's a good one. I think the Bunny we'll Rabbit, rabbit right Party. Bunny rabbit. <laughs> They're soft and cuddly. you got to love them. Cuddly. They're soft and cuddly. <laughs> and, and, and one ear for each right. wing. <laughs> <laughs> but for me, I'm soft and cuddly. <laughs> sent that in yeah, very good all right on to issue number four with uh, mr larry schultz yes this one's a little bit difficult to explain as those who got my text last night uh may, may have uh noticed right, bill don't worry we're um, gonna help you out with this one <laughs> <laughs> and i need a lot of help so. see i didn't even look at bill when i said that. um look uh, a few months ago a district judge in Washington, D.C., dismissed criminal charges against a man named Fisher, a former police officer who was inside the Capitol on January 6th and who was charged, as many of them have been, with obstruction of an official proceeding. Um, The district judge dismissed it on the basis that he believed the statute didn't cover what Mr. Fisher had done which was just uh, go inside the building. I think he was charged with also assaulting a police officer. But the the judge said, no, no, this statute is very restricted and only deals with whether you messed with the papers and records necessary to uh, achieve the objective of the proceeding that day, which was, of course, to name our next president. Okay. That, that opinion dismissed the criminal charges. The D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, on a two-to-one vote, um, uh, issued an opinion rejecting that judge's opinion, reinstating the charges. He then appealed, the defendant appealed to the Supreme Court, and the shock is they took the case. Now, very few judges have made a finding so limiting that thing. 
And I suspect, uh, and I'll be interested to hear, that the Supreme Court took this case for the purpose of sending a loud and clear signal, oh yes, this statute Jack Smith used in 500 cases or whatever it is, does apply to a an attack on the Capitol where you have to hustle the vice president out the back door uh, to a waiting car because um, his life is actually endangered. I, I can't imagine how tearing up the papers would be obstruction, but murdering the guy who's going to going to oversee the vote uh, would not. Uh, and and that's kind of the situation that we're in. So I'm thinking that the Supreme Court took it in order to put that sort of loony notion aside and let these cases proceed. If not, then a lot of charges, a lot of charges against these January 6th defendants, including Trump, are going to be dismissed. So my question is, what do you all think of this sort of uh, arcane um, little move by the Supreme Court? Generally, they took it a lot quicker than I ever would have expected them to. Joe Ferretti. Yeah, I think they're, they're, uh, the Supreme Court wants to come forth with a clear statement on this law. Uh, and, and I'll just remind folks, this Joseph Fisher, who uh, was a police officer, uh, while he was walking the halls of your Congress and, and causing your congressmen and women to be hiding uh, for fear of being lynched or, or assaulted, and while he was assaulting a Capitol Police officer, he was texting from the halls about the people of Congress. They can't vote if they can't breathe. This is the guy. So if you're thinking that the Supreme Court is going to come to the rescue and suddenly invalidate this law and follow this district court judge who narrowly interpreted it to the point where you have to destroy documents and papers in order to violate the law, but it's okay to assault a Capitol Police officer. It's okay to trespass in Congress and cause your Congress members to go in hiding. Uh, if you think the Supreme Court's going to validate that kind of conduct, I, I think you're dreaming. I think this, the court is going to have a clear expression as to how and why this law needs to be applied in these cases, and there's not going to be any relief for Mr. Fisher. Staying on the attorneys, Mr. Carl. I agree uh, with what was just said. Uh, the court, uh, but I also think that that the court is very aware of the you know broader political implications of 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 this issue, and by sending the signal, uh, I, I particularly the you know the three Trump appointees, I, I think they're going to vote nine zero. To um, uh, uh, you know, affirm the this appellate court's overriding of this crazy interpretation. It's just absurd, but it, it's a it's a, it, to me legally it's a no brainer that 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 uh, obstruction can involve more than tearing up papers, and and it gives the Supreme Court a chance to send a signal about how independent they are and that they aren't in Trump's pocket. Yeah, uh, first, uh, this is separate from the Jack Smith request to the Supreme Court, does President Trump have immunity? This is a separate issue altogether. Uh, the This particular case all defines upon the definition of obstruction of justice. Uh, the first judge had a very narrow definition of obstruction of justice. The appeal court had a broader definition, which included uh, uh, corrupt intent or targeting the proceeding. Uh, in this case, the proceeding was the, uh, the certification of uh, Joe Biden winning the election in 2020. Uh, so it all hinges with uh, the definition, the Supreme Court definition of obstruction of justice. And Mike Carl, I, I do not have the insight you do. I have absolutely no idea if it's going to be what the uh, decision of the Supreme Court will be. But I very much agree with Mike, uh, uh, with Larry Schultz. It has major consequences, not only for those individuals that have already been convicted uh, for uh, uh, 
obstruction of justice and terrorism on January the 6th, and I use the word terrorism somewhat guardedly, uh, the, but it's going to also future cases as well. What does obstruction of justice mean? Michael, I, I, you know, I, I'm very glad to see that the Supreme Court has taken this uh, so quickly, that they're usually very slow to act and, and very methodical when they take these cases. And they've taken this pretty quick. And I think it's because that this, this January 6th thing has drug on for a long time, and, and they want to put it to bed. And and I'm going to uh, agree with uh, Mike Carl. This 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 is ridiculous. I don't know how this was overturned to begin with. They're going to find, in my opinion, they're going to find that the uh, that there was obstruction here. It's not just about tearing up papers. Um, if you if you cause Congress to have to leave the building in fear, then that there's some a level of obstruction there. And those who stormed the Capitol should be prosecuted. That there was no excuse for any of that behavior. I knew many people that were at that protest, and it was a peaceful protest up to a point. And and when it started getting bad, they said, no, nah, I don't want to be a part of this, and they left, which is what everybody should have done instead of storming the Capitol. What the hell were you thinking? You know, so these people need to be prosecuted, um, but they need to be prosecuted with the – the, the level of obstruction or whatever uh, uh, charge is against them. I think it has been drug on for too long. There have been people that have been held since this um, without being charged. This needs to end, and this needs to end quick. Well, one of those folks videotaped himself. He was at the time elected to, to the House of Delegates, never did get to serve, but he's now running for Congress against Carol Miller, Derek Evans. <laughs> Yeah, good luck, um, buddy. The only thing I would <laughs> comes back comes back to you, Larry. I, I, the only, who knows? He may, may he may appeal to a lot of voters. The only thing I would add uh, to that is to say that if the Supreme Court does what we think it will do, issues a nine zero ruling very clear and full of language uh with all kinds of warnings and and uh sort of uh, future uh difficulties uh laden in it uh then i believe we're going to see a rush of guilty pleas <laughs> not only will we not slow down the process i think we'll speed it up uh the court has every reason now to to they, they have a specific argument as to why this statute shouldn't apply. But they might as well consider all the other potential arguments as to why it shouldn't apply and set out a very clear rule. And I think once they do, there's going to be a rush of guilty pleas, and we're going to see a lot of these cases move along. All right. Thank you, Larry. We move on to issue number five. And, Mike, I want you to know some of the Facebook crew has come to your defense in the uh, weeks that you've been out, they say you get the short shrift in the last seat. Your issue never goes on long enough. So today, we have 12 minutes. Oh, man. Well, well I, I want to move to a, a sort of the international level in a, in a, in a sense. Uh, it has bothered me for for a long time, but partic- you know, more so recently. The uh, m- intermingling of the need for comprehensive immigration reform. I mean, there's no question we need we need that. Larry already gave you a big sigh, Mike. And because he knows the border's coming up next. <laughs> but 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 the border needs to be secure, or you don't have a country. And those things should not be intertwined. We need to secure the border now, and stop anybody from coming across until. Uh, you know, who, who doesn't have a, a, a visa or <laughs> or in the U.S. isn't, and 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 then as soon as we can reform the, the immigration system, and we ought to also anybody who's found here who 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 snuck in, you know, who didn't even go through the the corrupt or, or you know her- horrible process that we're now using, uh, should, should should be automatically uh, uh, sent out. And, and with, with, with penalties and, and difficulty to ever come back. Now, why, why you know, the, 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 uh, you know, particularly the Democrats are uh, mingling the need for reform with border security, uh, it, it's, you know, it's just politically, you know, playing games, and, and Biden's efforts have been horrible. 
And in the meantime, the Republicans are intertwining it with aid to Ukraine. So the, this, uh, this whole southern border. Well, those, those are both from, national security issues. They're all intertwined, though, aren't they? Right? National security. Yeah. Yeah. If, if, if Russia merges and gets stronger, that hurts us, too. Just like uh, an, an open border. Mr. Schultz, I'll start with you first. Okay. Um, certainly, we've had problems on our southern border for a very long time. It's not just people coming in. There are drugs coming in. Um, um, We had a president, I seem to recall, who was going to build a wall all the way across the bottom of the country. Um, We got a couple hundred miles, and then we never hear about it anymore. Um, And so there's always going to be that pressure for people to come here. If what we do is simply wall it off... um, for one thing, uh, anybody who employs people in this country had better be prepared to start paying higher wages. Because as we stand right now, we have 3.5% unemployment or so, and there are 1.3 jobs for every unemployed person in this country. So clearly the free market tells us wages aren't high enough yet. The problem is, even if we get them astronomically high, we're not going to have enough workers to do the work. That's going to affect U.S. growth. That's going to affect our economic future. We need more people. And I'm sorry, overturning Roe v. Wade is not going to be the solution. (laughs) Uh, We need people to immigrate to our country. So one of the things I would suggest that we never hear is let's improve the facilities and the speed by which people who are lawfully coming here can come here. And let's find a way to get good people in this country who can take some of these jobs and even out this uh, even out this economic cycle. I, I don't know that simply walling it off is going to, or you know, putting a, a row of soldiers across there with guns is going to necessarily work anyway, because it seems like no matter what we've tried, a certain number of people get in, uh, no matter what. Um, we we need to do a better job of a coordinated, reasonable, regular immigration system because our birth rate is not going to keep us a wealthy country for much longer. Our birth rate is such that we're already getting older as a society. We need younger people with their energy and their diligence uh, to work hard uh, in order for our economy to succeed long term. Um, and to support the Social Security tax system. Well, geez, as a 65-year-old, I sure second that. <laughs> <laughs> Would that conclude your statement, yes. Mr. Schultz? <laughs> Mr. Stubblefield. Yeah, call me slow, call me anything you want to, but I cannot see the distinction between or the separation between a border and and our immigration system. Without an immigration system that works, you might as well build a wall without any openings whatsoever because you cannot control the influx unless there's some orders, some definition of who can come in or who uh, who can pass through. Uh, I think we need to get off dead center. We've been the Congress that has been kind of a secondary issue on administrations going back five or six or seven of addressing our immigration policy and getting something that will that people fully understand it will work. I'm hoping right now that there is somewhat of a mood among the our congressmen, at least on the Senate side, there appears to be producing a meaningful, workable immigration policy. Mr. Ferretti. Well, this, this issue frustrates me to no end. Uh, I, I think it's fair to say that Republicans have a point about border security. I think it's lacking. I don't know why. Uh, Congress is the appropriator of funds for border security. The president signs off on it. Where, where's the problem? Uh, if, if Congress won't move forward because the president won't sign, uh, you know, then, then you know, run to the, to the television stations and, and come forth with your legislation and your funding and, and, and show us that that's what's happening. I, I don't see that. I just see a lot of hand-wringing and politicking, but I don't see any action. So I, I, 
I can understand the border security issue, and I think we need to address that. Uh, immigration as a whole, uh, bear in mind statistically, as a percentage of the U.S. population, the number of people immigrating to this country is the same as it was in 1880. All right. So we, you know, this is in, in terms of people coming to this country, we've always had this level of, of folks coming to the country. And it's needed more than ever because we have the, the lowest unemployment rate historically that I've seen. And, and we have the uh, uh, certainly the need for for to fill these job openings where it's at, at the highest level that I've seen in my lifetime. So how do we fill these jobs? Uh, you know, the Labor Department, the United States Labor Department, has an interesting program. It used to be called Schedule A, and it was a program that we ran in the 60s where we would match up immigrants to job openings. Statistically, we would figure out where do we need people to fill jobs, and those were the kind of people we let in the country. If it was in the health industry, it was, if it was in construction industry or whatever, we sought those people out. We got them through in, in the immigration system, and they became U.S. citizens and filled those jobs. We don't do that anymore. And so there's, there's opportunities here to make use of a very effective and essential immigration system. We just got to have the political will to do it and quit demagoguing the issue, which is really, I think, all that people want to do these days. David Valente thinks we, as West Virginians, need to secure the Maryland border. I think he's taking a shot at me getting me off the show here, David. I, I appreciate your efforts there. And I welcome the opportunity to sleep in past 3.20 a.m. Mr. Height. Uh, I'm going to agree with, with Mike Carl here that I, I think the, there has to be both reform and security, but you have to secure the border first. You have to stop the flow or at least slow the flow to control that and then deal with reform second. And I, I definitely believe that, that reform is needed, that, that to come here legally has become onerous and expensive and, and many people just can't afford to do it the correct way, which is why you see so much of the influx along our southern, southern border right now. But we have to control it. You know, we had a president who said, make America great again. Let's let's secure the border. Let's build some security fences and walls. Let's do all these things. Let's have some reform. That president was William Jefferson Clinton in 1993. I don't see why when a Democratic president can say the same things as a Republican president, why we can't agree to do those things that we need to have these reforms and we need to have this security at our southern border. Mr. Carl, it comes back to you. Well, uh, a lot of good points, but the fact is that the uh, Democratic-controlled executive branch has a responsibility to secure the border, you know, and and I just to show you, you know, I'm not uh, just being you know blindly partisan. The there are many uh, you know business based Republicans, you know, who who are so concerned about the uh, employment levels and you know cheap labor, <laughs> to be blunt about it, that 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 they're that they they're not putting the pressure on the current executive branch to. Protect the country, and 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 that we need to reform it, and because of the labor issues and all that, but but just getting cheap labor in, you know, because it's loose and, and the border is not secure, is absurd and and, and terribly anti-American. So so we the the executive branch of the current administration, Marcus and all, you know, and even the vice president who was put in charge of it because Biden knew what a bomb it was to uh, uh, should you know need to enforce the law and protect the country number one and then we can manage uh, lawful immigration to provide you know employment and so forth 